Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me for this, uh, uh, this talk, speech, or whatever. Uh, the, today, the you know, I'm going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and future. It's not just artificial intelligence, but generally the technology. You know, the way the technology is going to develop in the next uh, a few years to come, and the way it's going to influence our lives is something that I want to talk to all the students and faculty and all the all the listeners. The reason I'm actually talking about this is I, I believe that this is going to be the most important subject or the most important thing that is going to affect our lives in the next two, three, four decades, or in fact, many decades to come. And I think it's very important that we understand what's likely to happen. Uh, now, if I, if I want to talk about the technological change and uh, at least the speed at which the technology is changing, uh, let me just tell you, you know, how the whole thing has uh, changed. We can talk about, you know, if we start from the beginning of the universe, the universe got created 14 billion years ago, and then Earth got created for, for 4.5 billion years ago, and, and life Sir, started... Excuse me, can you put it on the slideshow mode? Sorry? To full screen? Yeah, it is if full I screen. Can you do it? Uh, Hello? At the bottom it is there. Sir. Or you can press F5. Yeah, why don't you use it? Uh, hello? Sir, can you please can you make it full screen? Yeah, it is full screen. So can you please press F5? It is little less. Uh... Is it okay? Now it is okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So 14 billion years ago, the universe, we, we, the universe was created 14 billion years ago. Then Earth was created 4.5 billion years ago. And the first living being came to existence 3.75 billion years ago. Human history spans for 100,000 years. And uh, according to... <clears throat> Uh, you know, several experts, uh, the, the, there were three epochs, agriculture, industry, and services. Uh, agriculture spans, uh, spanned for tens of thousands of years, industry for a few centuries after the Industrial Revolution, and services only for a few decades after 1960s. Now, the progress that we made, the technological progress that we made in the agricultural era, there is tens of thousands of years, was Minuscule. I mean, there was hardly any progress at all. The way we lived yesterday was the same that we live today, and and the way we lived last week was the same that we lived this week and this month and this year and this decade and this century and so on. So I think in the tens of thousands of years there was hardly any progress. Then it came industrial revolution, and the progress that we made in the few centuries of industrial revolution was much higher than the progress that we made in tens of thousands of years of agriculture. Which means, and and then followed the era of services. And services means modern services, which actually started with the advent of uh, modern computers in 1960s. Uh, and see, you know, uh, the progress that we made since then in a few decades was much higher than the progress that we made in a few centuries of industrial, after the industrial revolution, which in turn was much, much higher than the progress that we made in tens of thousands of years of agriculture. So you are all engineering students, so you understand calculus. So we are talking about D2I by DX2, or not, not DY by DX. So rate of, rate of change is so high. And just to give you an idea, the progress that we made in the last 10 years, the technological progress that we made in the last 10 years, is, was much higher than the progress that we made in the entire history of human beings. And the reason is not because we have become suddenly very wise or very intelligent. We have not. But we are standing on the shoulders of our predecessors. The way Newton used to say, I'm standing on the shoulders of Galileo and uh, Copernicus and so on. We are standing on the shoulders of thousands, if not lakhs, of scientists and technologists who are working globally on a variety of technologies. <laughs> And that's why the rate of progress is very, very, very high. I mean, we can't even you know, we can't even imagine. And many people have stopped predicting about what's likely to happen in future because quite a few people had, you know, predicted that a few things will happen in ten years or twenty years, and those things have happened in two years or three years. So the predictions have fallen flat 
<laughs> because the, the, pro, the technological progress has outpaced. I mean, it is extremely rapid. And that's the, the reason is many technologies are coming together. And that's something that we need to uh, bear in mind. Now, if you look at the only services era, the, the information technology, 1960s was the era of mainframes, 70s mini computers, 80s was PCs, 90s was internet, 2000 onwards was mobile computing and tech convergence. And 2000 onwards was industrial industry 4.0, and I'm going to talk about that. <clears throat> In 1960s, the, the era was mainframe, mainframes were very large, they used to emit heat. They were not all reliable, but they were they had batch processing. And they were not real time and online, not many. I mean, IBM 317 3 onwards had actually started the online processing uh, or transaction processing, as it was called then. But uh, mainly it was used in banks for batch processing and storing large amount of data for back end processing. 1970s saw the, uh, the computer size uh, uh, reduced, computer prices reduced, and therefore you could see multiple computers in one company. Uh, purchasing department had one, and production department had one, and so on, and they were all mini computers. We, you know, DEC, uh, 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 Digital Equipment Corporation, Data General, Prime, and Wang, and so on. These are the companies, Hewlett Packard, these are the companies which, who, who produced mini computers, and actually they were installed on variety of companies, but they still had not become commonplace, and people, common people were still afraid of computers. They, they did not use computers, they were not you know, familiar with how to use computers and so on. Only experts used to use computers. And therefore, the fear of using computers was still there in, in the minds of common people. But that changed in the 1980s when personal computers came. The prices fell, the sizes reduced, and PCs started appearing on every table of every manager, every, every officer, every lawyer, every engineer, every doctor and many households and so on. They were expensive in the beginning. Like in India, they used to cost around two lakhs and so on, but later on the, the price uh, <coughs> reduced. And then PC, the main thing happened was <coughs> that there were colors in the PC. For personal computers uh, had colors. They were multimedia. You know, multimedia means there were four types of media in which human beings have communicated with each other uh, from, the, from the beginning. One is text, that is A to Z, uh, zero to nine, etc. Uh, when we type anything on the word processor, it is converted into zeros and ones, and ASCII or FCDIC or whatever, and then stored in zeros and ones on computers. When a digital photo means the photo is converted into zeros and ones. Then sound, any sound is also converted into zeros and ones. And then video, when we play a DVD or even on mobile, when you uh, have a video, it's converted into zeros and ones. So in all four forms of media, there is text, audio, video, and photo. If they can be converted into zeros and ones, can be stored onto the computer, can be deleted, can be transmitted, can be modified. That's what is called as multimedia. And therefore, multimedia came, with the, the, uh, uh, col there were colors and there was graphical user interface. With keyboard or mouse, you could actually change the entire thing. So with these three, the, the PCs became user friendly and therefore, you know, most of the people lost or actually shed their fears about using computers and they started, uh, you know, embracing computer technology wholeheartedly. And that happened uh, across companies and across applications and therefore several PCs were networked together to servers and, you know, various uh, uh, large computers. And in 1990s, internet actually flourished. And therefore, most of the companies started using computers in their applications. See, until then, you must remember that computers were used only as a tertiary help to the main business. My main business was producing soaps and computers were used, were used to do accounting for you know, my purchases and sales and so on and so forth. But come 1980s and 1990s, computers actually or information technology, which means computers and communications together, to occupy the central stage. I mean, they started driving the, the, the businesses, which essentially meant that computers no longer were just sort of bystanders and just sort of helping the main businesses, but they were part and parcel of driving the profitability and the operation of the main businesses. And that's what changed the entire 
uh, uh, the way you did business. Uh, you know, in fact, in management, we call that as business process reengineering. It, the whole thing was quite fashionable in 1980s and 90s when I was actually, you know, doing the software exports. General Electric took a lead in this. Business process reengineering meant not just changing the processes and improving slightly, but completely revamping these processes using computer technology or computers and communications. And that was essentially so, so throw the old processes and build new processes using computers and communications. If you want to do purchasing, Earlier, you had to have purchase order manually prepared, maybe then typed on a computer and then sent, etc. But now we're using various techniques and technologies with supply chain and various things which I won't go into. The old processes were changed completely and the new processes were brought in, which is why most of the companies actually had to build their new computer systems. And therefore, they require hundreds and thousands of programmers. Because if you don't, if you did not use computers for your uh, business, you were you were thrown into the dustbin. I mean, they, they, you, you could not stand in the rat race of competition. So it was not just sort of that computers were nice to have, but it was absolutely necessary. I'll give you an example. Take DTP, for instance. When you're desktop publishing, you know, today without desktop publishing, no pub publisher, of newspapers or books or whatever can even exist. I mean, leave alone being competitive. Gone are the days when earlier there were typewriters and you know people used to type documents and and so on and so forth. And when newspapers used to be produced, there was to be you know they were using old technology, and uh, the fonts had to be organized and page wise, and then the whole page had to be composed and then. Uh, the, the newspaper had to be had to be printed. <clears throat> Imagine at 10 o'clock, if a news uh, paper uh, gets a news that American president has been assassinated, what can you do? You could not do anything at all. You had to wait for the next day until you got all the news from various sources and there was no internet then. So you, you had to wait until you got all the information from various sources and then, then compose the new page and the next day you, you could give the information. I will give the produce the newspaper, but with DTP, if there if something happens at ten o'clock in the night, within thirty minutes you can get all the information from internet, various various videos and audios and various interviews of various people after that assassination. The compose the new new the news item, shift it to, to to the main first page. And move from the first page to the fourth page, what you were to print uh, on the first page. So you reorganize your newspaper within half an hour. And then next day morning, six o'clock or five o'clock or seven o'clock, all the people get the news with the front page of the, you know, the news of uh, the assassination. The point I'm trying to make is if some newspaper says, I will not use DTP, that newspaper will actually just sort of, uh, will lose the competitive game. I mean, it will not exist. This is just one example. But what that means is that the old jobs were destroyed and new jobs were created. When, when word processor and DTP came, all, all the jobs of the typists vanished. Or say second, second example, ATMs. When ATMs came, the jobs of Taylor clerks who used to be who used to dispense cash for you in the banks, the, all those jobs were, were lost. When animation software came, hundreds and thousands of uh, 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 Artists who used to draw various drawings for an animation film. Walt Disney used to employ hundreds of artists in his garage, for instance. All of those lost their jobs because there was a 2D animation and now there's 3D animation. Without 2D or 3D animation, no advertisement or no film can be made today. I mean, you can be rest assured. In fact, if, if somebody you know brings in a law in the parliament that you cannot use 2D or 3D animation, the first one to commit suicide will be Rajnikanth, I guess, because it will be impossible for him or to, to produce anything at all. So I think it is very important that the IT did not remain as a as a third by, tertiary bystander, but became a main driver of technology, whether it is retail, whether it is education, whether it is whatever, and that created a huge shortage of programmers in America. And that's when I was in Patni then, Narayan Muthi left Patni, I started Patni, left, uh, uh, you know, and I, uh, I was, a, I was a, uh, uh, ran Patni for 11 years, and then I was, I ran 
uh, Sintel as, as managing director for four years and LNT as a CEO for four years. And in all these years, we used to go to America and say, you, you have to pay $100 for uh, a programmer in America. I will give you a programmer for $60 in America and $30 if you do the work in India. And in 1990s, because of internet, you could use you know, the back uh, the uh, uh, centers, you could open centers in Pune, Hyderabad, Bangalore, and so on and so forth. And therefore offshore centers flourished because of internet. And you could do the same job for $30, which you had to pay $100 in America, which is why all the so-called IT revolution took place in India. But that's the whole, whole uh, uh, history. After 2000, mobile computing and tech conversions took place. The tech conversions essentially means the television, mobile, and computers coming together. That's what is called as technology conversions, which took place today on the mobile. You can use compute, you can use computing, you can do word processing, you can use, uh, I mean, you can just do anything. You can use uh, watch films. So you, if, if, in years to come, mobile will be the device which you know you probably may not need anything else. And 2000, 2011 onwards, what we are now seeing is what we call as industry, industrial 4.0. Actually, it's industry 4.0. There's a spelling mistake. It's industry 4.0. Now, what is industry 4.0? You know, the, uh, the first three industrial revolutions, the first industrial revolution was steam engine in 1750. Second industrial revolution was mass production using electricity in 1920s when there was, you know, mass production, as you know, the Ford Motors came into existence and there was the assembly line and Frederick Taylor, you know, was the one who laid foundation of management principles for the production lines and so on. And in Charlie Chaplin's modern times, you can see the, the, the in fact, the effect on workers and so on and so forth. But that increased productivity enormously. The third the industrial revolution took place in computers and automation, as we saw just now, 1960 onwards to now. But the fourth industrial revolution, the industry 4.0, will be fueled, and that that will continue for the next three, four decades. And that will be fueled by what? And that will be fueled by cloud computing, 5G, IoT, IoT, smart homes, factories, big data from social media sensors, transactions, etc. Augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D printing, and AI. I don't think I, I need to explain to you what all this means because I saw somebody getting an award right now for 3D printing. So I, I, I believe that you understand what that really means. But I just want, thought I'll, I'll just explain in a couple of sentences so that you, you those who are not familiar with this will, will understand. Cloud computing is essentially, essentially a large data center maintained by somebody else. Earlier, you had to have a computer within your uh, compound, and then there was a cost associated with the land and maintenance of the equipment and the buying purchases of the software and so on and so forth. But with cloud computing, there are companies, large companies, who maintain a huge amount of battery of servers, hundreds and thousands of servers with large disk capacity. And they also have software like SAP, for instance. They maintain large battery of variety of software products as well. And they say to you, why don't you, instead of buying hardware and software applications and operating systems and networking hardware and software, etc., why don't you rent it from us? So I think it's essentially a renting concept that these companies provide. And that is, that is really catching up very, very fast. Google, Amazon, and most of the companies use cloud. Quite a few emails that we write today or quite a few conversations that we have amongst each other are actually put on cloud and they're retrieved and brought to you as and when necessary. 5G is essentially extremely fast communication uh, 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 system. It requires different towers, by the way. It, it, it has different frequencies. It is a different technology. You can use the same towers and just change does make some small changes and, and convert into 5G. So 5G is an entirely different ballgame. I have another slide for this. IoT is Internet of Things. The whole idea is that all the equipment that, that we have in the house, uh, including uh, uh, you know uh, micro, microwaves and refrigerators and washing machines and so on, or ACs, are, should be smart. What do we mean by smart? 
they should have microprocessors inside them and they should be connected to internet so they should be able to communicate with the internet it's not that it's not sufficient to be just smart which means they are processors today also washing machine has a process microprocessor and there's an embedded software in it when we actually press and say uh, run it for 10 seconds or, or, or half a minute and the washing machine rotates for half a minute or microwave oven etc we we say you know heat it for one minute essentially it's an instruction to the embedded software and embedded software rotates the whole disk and so on and so forth but that does not create iot iot means all these equipment are connected and communicating through internet which is why internet of things about if if you seen i mean amitabh bachchan's advertisement he is standing some outside and he wants to change the temperature of air condition in the house before even coming to the house and he changes it with the mobile in his hand that's essentially defines what iot is and there are various advantages and disadvantages there are sensors that will be there on your body or variety of equipment on etc etc that will be used to communicate iot is industrial internet of things which essentially means all the machines within the factories also will be will be communicating with each other through internet so if there is a part that is actually going bad or likely to go bad it will detect itself or machine or in the car the carburetor or the engine etc will detect that i am actually you know i need maintenance so that we will send a message through internet to either the driver or in fact flash on the bo- on the dashboard and, and then the uh, if it is very very intelligent and tomorrow's world there will be driverless cars in which case it like automatically take it to the nearest garage using obviously google maps and so on so i think the whole whole thing is you know moving towards a hugely automated kind of thing and that's going to change the landscape of the way we do things the way we work in homes and factories and that's going to change the way that's going to eliminate several jobs and i'm going to come to that according to some estimates of uh, uh, world bank 67% of the jobs will either uh, uh, perish there is they will be they will not be required or they will change the 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 way we do those jobs so the nature of jobs are going to change so un- unlearning and learning is going to be an extremely important thing if we want to succeed in tomorrow's world so all these students who are actually listening to me i don't want to frighten you but i i certainly want to tell you what's in store for you in years or in decades to come because it's very important for you to be prepared for what's likely to happen just to sort of deviate from what from this slide a sociologist has said that each one will have to change one's job six times in one's lifetime six times that doesn't mean changing a job doesn't mean from tcs to infosys or city bank to bank of india changing a job means unlearning and learning because things will change the way you you used to do things will not be necessary will not be required it will be obsolete the rate of obsolescence is going to increase enormously as i've said with atms the teller clerks were were gone with uh, dtp and word processing the typists were gone with animation the uh, artists had gone with cad cam with draftsmen were had, had gone with driverless car, cars lakhs of drivers will go and hundreds of things which which you know as, as i probably if i have time i'll tell you but the many many jobs will change or will vanish and i think new jobs will emerge but they will not match the 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 way the number of jobs that will perish so i think there's going to be whole issue of unemployment and therefore the ubs the universal basic income and so on but we may not have time to discuss all that now big data it is 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 something that we need to be aware of big data just doesn't mean the size is very large size obviously is very large but the structured data like from you know employee data purchasing data and so on which is structured and you know there are rows and columns and so on but there's unstructured data which is like social media conversations or from sensors or from credit card transactions and there are hundreds of other things uh, there is the uh, various videos that you put on the social media today or audios and so on so for the all that forms the data by the and that data is increasing enormously enormously is only only term now is it how 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 good is it the important thing is this big data is oil for artificial intelligence because today the entire and i'll come to that big data essentially means finding out relationship between various data items or data sets so that is what is called data analytics which is why the whole thing of data science is emerging and people are going crazy because it's you know people are getting 
jobs of 20 lakhs per annum and 30 lakhs per annum who are good in data science and that figure will continue rising the data scientists that will be required will be very very large the salaries also very very large but the data scientist will be required to understand artificial intelligence machine learning big data data analytics statistics and so on so there are a variety of things that will actually converge in what is called as data science and i just want to sort of touch up on this but big data essentially means find out relationship between them just to give you an example for instance in a bank there's a large amount of data and you know in normally in a query in database query you know what you want so if you want to know how many students are there who have got more than 50 marks so you ask the database query is in sql and it will give you a list of students who have scored more than 50 marks but in big data or data analytics you ask the the, the software to find out relationship you don't know what you want so big data for instance in a bank it comes out with it, it on the it uses very statistical correlation and various other uh, uh, systems and then comes up with uh, maybe an analysis saying that if somebody is working in a bank for three years and is MBA then that person is likely to buy a car with 80 percent probability when that sort of relationship is given to the bank managers then ma'am bank manager's job is to find out the mobile numbers of those pe people with three years experience and MBA and then give the those numbers to a call center to chase them for the loan for cars. I mean, this is how it works. So uh, this is just one area, but there are hundreds of other areas in big data, for instance, essentially means social media uh, communications. So using artificial intelligence in machine language, machine uh, learning and natural language processing, you can understand the conversation. So if two people are talking to each other, how do you understand? So that requires understanding of natural language because we are not, the people are not talking in COBOL or Fortran or R or Python. They're talking in English, or Marathi or Hindi. So you have to understand the meaning, extract the meaning. So if there is a, if, if somebody is talking about bomb all the time, or maybe you know some weapons all the time, or maybe in code language, in weapons or bombs or something like that all the time, then you can infer that he must be a terrorist. So the, the AI today, big data is used to sort of surf through a large amount of data to, to arrive at tendencies of various people. It's all, it can be also misused for uh, uh, surveillance of you know what kind of political ideologies you have and then maybe, you know, make, uh, maybe have some kind of surveillance, which is a bad thing. But I think the whole idea of big data and, and AI merging is this, and that's the then augmented reality and virtual reality, as you know, with augmented reality, I, I can sit here and I can, the, the pay company which manufactures paint for my house, I can, it gives me a choice. If I give the, the whole structure of my rooms and etc. cetera, the, the, the company allows me to see, oh, if I give this color to this wall, if I give this color to this, how will it look without even actually painting them? And after looking and then finding out how it looks, then I make a choice and then I actually buy that paint and then paint my house. So this is, I just wanted to explain with an example what our augmented reality can do. And the same thing about our shirt. Without buying a shirt, I can actually see how it looks on me. The same thing about cosmetics and hair styles and various things. So, I mean, AR is actually going to play a very important role. There are a variety of other good uses as well of AR, VR, like medical surgery, while teaching surgery, you don't need to do surgery on a, on a, on a autopsy on a body. I mean, you can do a, a digital body today. I mean, there are various things I need, don't need to talk about. 3D printing, as you probably are aware, you know, is, is, is the thing of tomorrow and is going to change the way we do things. Artificial intelligence, and I have, with 5G, I have uh, this one slide, data rates of five giga, gigabits per second today, Necessity of more bandwidth due to IoT, IoT, AI, AR, VR, we need bandwidth. Can handle 1,000 times more traffic than 4G, by the way. 10 times faster than 4G. Can download high density cinema in less than one second. So that is the whole. It uses these five technologies, which I don't think we'll have time to discuss. Artificial intelligence consists of expert systems, natural language processing, robotics, machine learning, and deep learning. And I have explained to you what all this means. 
I just will concentrate for a couple of minutes on machine and deep learning because I mean many of you must have known this, but I, I just want to tell you what is the difference between classical artificial intelligence, classical or that's called a symbolic AI, and machine learning. or deep learning deep learning is a part of machine learning when the machine learning essentially is based on artificial neural network which tries to replicate or mimic or simulate the human brain human brain consists of the the network of various neurons and therefore if we create this kind of network artificially it's called artificial neural network and it consists of various layers and if the number of layers are very large it's called the deep learning they are very small it's called the machine learning is that simple as that but what do we mean by this I, I, i we don't have time to sort of explain in detail how how it is done but i'll just to give an example normally what we do is we have a program and in the program we the program goes through uh, the database and gives results so program gives results in machine learning and deep learning it is a data which is fed which is a big data is so important and used as is called as oil for ai it is a data that is used for uh, uh, machine learning and the, the algorithm is the result and what what actually comes out is an algorithm i'll give you an example for instance if i want to do machine translation automatically and this is actually true because in europe uh, each document that is produced has to be translated into 20 languages languages simultaneously in canada in two languages french and english and there are hundreds and thousands of documents every month so they had they had to actually it was a tedious job and hundreds of people had to do this tedious job so can we do this automatically was the question and that question was solved by machine learning yeah, and how how can it be solved classically what did you have to do you had to actually write a program of if this is a word in english what is the word in french so essentially build a dictionary two dictionaries and have the the you know for we we which word what what to be replaced but then there are phrases and there are sentences and there are each has a flavor you know so it's very hard for a, for somebody to to program so many possibilities of translating from one language to another using if then else statement and so on and so forth with machine learning what they did was they actually had passed uh, hundreds and lakhs of sentences which were ready in english as well as french so they fed these sentences fed one sentence in english one sentence in french which was equivalent which was translated and the uh, the program in the computer the job of the program is to find the similarities and build an algorithm to learn from this to build dictionaries to find similarities and what should be substituted to what and so on essentially the algorithm to translate so when the only the first sentence was fed obviously it made some mistakes we obviously did some when arrived at some conclusions which were obviously not very correct because there was only one data was very small the second sentence was fed then it used the first and second both and tried tried to figure out what must be right and what was the is this verb what is similarity five it actually tried to figure out what is a verb what is a noun you see the whole whole sort of motivation from this came from how a child learns to a child when we teach child a language we don't teach this is a noun this is a verb this is a verb. we don't teach the grammar to a child but child still learns and actually starts talking and that's how an idea came to mind after you know 2000 or something and it started if the child can learn this why can't we build an algorithm which looking at similarities can build an algorithm which learns build a program which translates learns and translates so that's how they actually fed one two lakhs of sentences and the algorithm kept on finding out similarities not just in words but phrases and sentences and many many you know uh, things and ultimately you had a program which actually translates up to 96 97% of at least government documents so it's still sort of a long way to go if you are to translate a novel or a poetry etc but today the the, the auto, who, what does google translate do for it obviously google translate is not very good to, to translate a, a, a novel or a piece of literature but for ordinary sentences for a lot of sentences in fact and translate from 100 languages by the way 
and that is done because it it is fed with data so it, the data is input unlike in the first case we have algorithm giving data for machine learn, deep learning it is data which actually gives an algorithm so i think this is the ma main basic difference between the way machine learning is, is and that is used the face recognition and that is used for driverless cars and so on and deep learning and machine learning is going to play havoc in tomorrow's world and therefore data science which consists of big data machine learning and deep, uh, deep learning and data analytics and variety of things is going to be the key in tomorrow's world because in tomorrow's world quite a few industries retail businesses and various companies are going to use data science and data scientists to build models which will increase their profitability in sales so this is this is what i want to wanted to say now i'll just finish in the next 5 uh, to 8 minutes uh, 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 telling you as to why and how jobs are going to change and what, what we need to do to to sort of succeed in tomorrow's world i have some six examples as i have said atms came and then uh, Taylor Clark's uh, uh, were jobless or had to uh, unlearn and learn with animation artists, CAD CAM draftsmen, word processing and DTP typists, insurance and banking managers, agents and accountants, driverless cars, drivers, software programmers. There are, uh, in fact, travel agents. See, you must real uh, like telephone automotive. with call centers and automated telephone systems telephone operators will be will not be necessary with language translation human translators will not be necessary turbo tax eliminated eliminated lacks of tax accountants by the way in fact internet is going to remove middlemen you know hundreds of bookshops are closing for instance why do you need to go to a bookshop and buy when you can buy from amazon or you know buy buy from in fact directly publishers if i want to buy a shirt in tomorrow's world and this was actually bill gates in 1996 wrote a book which is called as business at the speed of light in which he had predicted this and at that time internet was in a very nascent uh, stage you know had not developed but at that time he had the foresight to tell us that when internet comes of age that is it will become mature most of the middlemen will vanish if not now in the next 20 30 years like all the kirana shops of they will vanish why do you need them because like we, we, several people will directly from producers will actually gives the material to your, to your home like uh, the, the the medicines are now being you know uh, 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 there is an internet service to give medicines at your doorstep similarly vegetables so, so why do you need even medical shops tomorrow in tomorrow's world for us why do you need book shops why why do you need stores that you see which the very shirts and the neck ties are kept on a rack you can go to uh, uh, whatever company i mean i don't i don't shop too much but whichever van you say for instance and then on the website select your the size of the shirt the color of the shirt select and then uh, or maybe through amazon and then use maybe augmented reality to to see whether how it fits and how it looks on you and then just buy and that comes to you you don't need to go to a shop why does why does a shop needs to exist i think in tomorrow's world the kind of changes that will, that are going to change that that that, that you are going to witness are enormous so please understand this in tomorrow's world there will be no notes banks checkbooks credit cards nothing at all in china today nothing exists excepting the money on mobile in, in zeros and ones nothing at all so please understand i mean we, as i've said the, the technology is moving so fast just to give you an example I mean, today in china there are trains with 600 kilometers per hour in the in the latest is 10 story building 10 story building in china was built in 10 up in, in uh, 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 10 hours i think 10 hours or something like that they are sorry 10 Then uh, story building was built in 24 hours or something. I said extremely ridiculous. I mean, in one day you had a 10 story building. I mean that kind of thing. So it is absolutely, uh, in, a, in a sense, fascinating but frightening speed at which things are happening because of the modular way you build things. Plus nanotechnology, plus 3D printing, and hundreds of things will come together. And in tomorrow's world, you will ask yourself a question: Why do you need offices at all? All offices will become museums. because take banking for instance hundreds of these branches why do you need that i mean today obviously in india there is a lot of illiteracy and the, even the 
density of uh, smartphones is very less. So let's not talk about that. But maybe 20, 30 years. Why do you need a bank branch or bank itself? I mean, you, you need a loan to write an application to internet. It goes to, I mean, so you want to mortgage your house, so all the papers of the house also are attached. It's seen by the manager, manager approves the loan, the money comes electronically through your, into your account. Into your account means in your, in your mobile, the zeros and ones change, basically. Why do you need people just sort of go there in that building? All the data can be shared, data can be shared and used. So all, same with insurance, all the, even offices of companies, all the meetings can be done virtually, sitting at their homes, you know, and today that's happening maybe forcefully because of COVID, but, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make is all offices will become uh, museums. So the change, and this is not something that I'm predicting will happen at the end of the century. I believe myself that in the next 20, 30 years, this is going to happen, 30, 40 years. No currency, no, no book. This is, in fact, when my friend uh, Nandan Nilekani had, has given a speech on which must be available on, on YouTube, uh, the future of financial services. And there is, he had said, five, ten, I, 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 I used to tell him, when I, I, when I give my lecture, I used to say 15, 20 years. And he, he said five, ten years. And another five, ten years, even in India, that will probably go. And people used to laugh at me when I used to say that. But uh, with... Uh, Paytm and various various things that will take a little while in India to, to take root, but I think it will certainly happen. Flying cars, people used to laugh at me when I used to give talks about it. It's already unveiled in, in, in New York a few years ago. Don't try buying it because it's very expensive still, but it will come. With the flying cars, the entire travel, the entire uh, RTO, the whole thing is going to change. With driverless cars, it's going to change enormously. So uh, the, the, the point I'm to, trying to make is even the companies who did not sort of, uh, you know, could not uh, see the, the change coming had to wind up. And I've given a list. Like the people who cannot unlearn and learn very fast will be thrown to the periphery. And only those who, who are very good at core technologies and continuously update and continuously unlearn and learn can only exist in tomorrow's world. Please understand. Many companies were, were thrown to dustbin and very large companies, HMB, Woolworth, Blockbusters, Jessup, Virgin, Megastore, Habitat, Focus, and there are many, many, Royal Bank of Scotland, many of them were my, my customers in England and so on. Uh, now, Kodak was finished because Kodak st stuck to analog films and, uh, and did not accept digital film. And Fujifilm and Canon actually went ahead. Polaroid or did not exist or went down. Blockbuster, I used to take various videos, uh, you know, video cassettes in America, uh, in Cincinnati, in New York, in Blockbuster. They did not transform to digital mode and uh, they were uh, Phoenix with Netflix and iTunes and so on. With Borders, it was the biggest, very, very big uh, bookstore, by the way, uh, like uh, Barnes and Nobles, but was had to close down. Toys R Us, Pan Am, Compaq, there are a list of uh, companies which, which actually had to wind up. I'll end by in a couple of minutes. What should we do as, as a, a, anybody, in fact? A, you know, I would say three things, three, four things. One, you should be, even if things change in tomorrow's world, first, you should be very, very good in the current technology, whatever you are, whether civil engineer, architect, accountant, whatever. In whatever you know, whatever you do, okay, you must be good at what you do. You must have the fundamental knowledge, the knowledge of fundamental principles, <clears throat> so that you can accept the change. When it changes, if your fundamentals are right, you can learn and unlearn very fast. So your fundamentals have to be, have to be good. Point number one. Point number two, you should be able to unlearn and learn very very fast. Point number three, which is very important, it's not very good. It's not very, quite sufficient to be just good in your technology or whichever branch you are pursuing. <clears throat> you have to be an excellent communicator. And if, if, you, if you have to do, if you are in the exports business like the way I was, then you have to have good English as well. I mean, I, I hate to tell stories of my personal life, but I, all my education was in Marathi medium and thanks to some insult that I had to undergo in my first year of IIT, I had to 
work on my english and and uh, and really you know, for 10 months i did nothing but you know read english novels papers i had to stand in front of the mirror and and work on speaking in english the way we make mistakes is we actually think in marathi then translate in english and then speak and i've seen that happen many many times i had said to myself that that's not what i'm going to do i have to think in english and therefore uh, i took a continued reading in, even today my thinking actually is in english my reading also takes place in english because out, out of my several books that i have most of them are in english but that doesn't mean english I, i'm proud of english and marathi is bad i'm proud of marathi in fact i mean i'm very proud of marathi which is why i write in marathi all my 40 39 40 books are in marathi because i wanted marathi to be gyan bhasha in, in, in but if you have to succeed in tomorrow's world and if you're doing business with international companies you you have to be good in english you i mean if if you communicate well and it's not just english even if it's marathi hindi whatever your communication has to be good see your personality has to be good not just communication you have to be pleasant you have to have a good sense of humor you cannot just say i'm very good in operating you know c language or r or whatever language java and uh, you know the gone are the days when you know newton uh, sat on under a tree and then thought of gravity and so on you have to be a team worker you can't be a loner you can't be an egoist or egotist you have to be, you, 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 you if you smile if you have a good sense of humor if you take people along if you are a team worker if you are a good listener you will succeed and if you don't if you don't have these qualities you will fail regardless of whether you have you are very very bright or not gone are the days of newton i mean today even in r and d for instance even in r and d in pharma or in it it is team work it is not something that i'm sitting smoking a cigar and then suddenly i come up with an idea and then you know i almost every discovery invention whatever is a team work today in any any company so so please understand that in building your personality be, be, be believing and building teams and excellent communication are very important and obviously technology and learning learning etc and last uh, not last but one more is be entrepreneurial don't start thinking about just sort of where can i get a job and more importantly go how how can go to america and settle there i mean that's something you should never do i must tell you this i see a lot of uh, uh, bad things about chinese uh, society chinese government more than society chinese government and so on i'm not a great fan by the way but i must tell you there are hundreds and thousands of chinese students who go to america they study and most of them come back to to china and serve china in india most of the people go from india to america and then settle there and then teach us deshbhakti from there about to to us and then criticize india so i think that is certainly wrong and that, that is bad i would recommend i would request you go abroad study but come back and serve india i think it is very important that we need you i think it, uh, the the i'll be entrepreneurial also it's not just sort of taking up a job okay, well, how can i create something last but not the least you are the people who have had the good opportunity and good fortune to take education in in an organization in a, in a in a campus such as this which is really very good very progressive but half of india or i would say even 70 80% of india cannot afford this today our education system is really in, a, in an extreme amount of need and mess I mean, in fact i said there is the, i always say there is there are two indias india and bharat and however much progress you make wherever you are you go to america come back whatever don't forget the remaining indians who could not make it and didn't could not make it not because they were lacking in something but because we could not provide enough conditions for them to progress so i think it is very important that we always keep the other india in our mind as to what we can do about this if we do this then we not only will be successful but we also will be will emerge as a very very good individuals thank you very much